and welcome to Just One More Watch. Exactly two years ago, I had a proper dummy spit with Seiko, and I made this video saying that I was never going to buy or review another Seiko watch again but there was an asterisk on the thumbnail. And I said in that video, I was never going to buy or review another Seiko costing more than 1,000 US dollars again. I had looked at seven over the preceding 18 months and four of them had either alignment issues or movement issues or both. Now Seiko's poor quality control is something we all grind our teeth at but cope with in a watch costing $250, but something we should not have to cope with in a watch costing $1,250. And I say it again to all of you, if you want to spend more than a grand US on a Seiko, go for it, it's your money. But I strongly suggest you try and look at the actual watch you're gonna buy before you pay for it to ensure that everything lines up and you're happy with the quality control. I bought an SPB085 online from Japan and I almost cried when I opened the box and saw yet another misaligned bezel. And I have been true to my word over the last two years. I have bought or borrowed and then reviewed a ton of Seikos, but nothing over a grand. However, did I just break my vow? I recently picked up a King Seiko, the SPB287J1 with the gorgeous blood red dial it's on my wrist today and that costs rather a lot more than a grand US. In fact, the retail on one of these is 2,670 Aussie dollars, which is 1,800 US. It sounds a lot like I've been a very naughty boy, doesn't it? Have I broken my vow and destroyed my reputation as a credible watch reviewer? If I still had one, let's flip the camera and find out. Let's just confirm that price again before we move on. 2,650 Aussie is the full RRP from the Seiko Boutique. I haven't heard of the Seiko Boutique offering discounts, by the way. Now, this watch came from the Seiko Boutique in Sydney. The original owner did indeed pay 2,650 for it. I'll tell you what I paid a bit later. Now, if you weren't aware, King Seiko was a mid-level luxury line of watches by Seiko from 1961 to 1975. They were conceived to offer Japanese customers high quality Seiko branded products that were better than your average Seiko, but more affordable than a Grand Seiko. It also led to a bit of friendly in-house rivalry between those two premium lines. And as you can see here, they made some gorgeous watches under the King Seiko moniker. But like Grand Seiko, King Seiko was killed off by the Quartz Crisis, Quartz ironically being invented by Seiko. So a little unfriendly competition there then. And like Grand Seiko, King Seiko have now been resurrected. This original limited edition reissue came out in 2020. These non-limited edition Kings came out at the beginning of 2022 in a number of interesting dial colors. Now for me, the tobacco brown and my own red are the pick of the bunch. The packaging, I must say though, is weird. This is a very dressy 60s reissue watch coming in at close to 2000 US dollars. And they've chosen to present it in a canvas pouch? I just don't get that at all, I'm afraid. I am used to seeing these canvas pouches only occasionally, and even then from outdoorsy micro brands. To see one supplied with this style of watch is frankly bizarre. Anyway, plenty of spare links are provided. I have this one sized rather loosely, and I still have four spare links. So if you have eight inch plus wrists, but like a smaller watch, you are sorted here. And I do mean a smaller watch. This one comes in at 37 mil in diameter with a thickness of 12.4 and a really compact lug tip to lug tip of only 43 and a half. Lug width is the awkward 19 mil size. The very pleasant bracelet tapers a bit down from 19 to 17 at the butterfly clasp. And sized up for me, albeit loosely sized up for me, it weighs in at 122 grams. Crystal is a fantastic piece of boxed sapphire with anti-reflective coating. The watch has 100 meters of water resistance from a push-pull crown and contains Seiko's in-house caliber 6R31. You can't see that though because of the King Seiko embossed stainless steel screw on case back. 
having seen a couple of six hours before and not losing any sleep over that, especially as it's a rather nice case back featuring the original King Seiko logo from the 1960s, as you saw earlier on, on a vintage watch. But you did hear me right, six hour movement, 1800 US dollars, more on that later. The 31 features 24 jewels and a 70 hour power reserve, which is impressive. Not so impressive is the fact that it only has a three hertz beat rate and a stated accuracy of minus 25 to plus 25 seconds per day from the factory. Again, <coughs> More on that later. The case is lovely, really nice. The design is obviously based on a King Seiko case from the 1960s, but with contemporary standards of finishing. It's a three-piece case, but you can see the bezel extends right into the mid-case. There's a noticeable crease about 20% of the way down the side of the mid-case. Super fine horizontal brush on the sides and the upper lug surfaces with a large high polish facet to those lugs and a high polish fixed bezel. Now the bezel is stepped with an angled side and a flat upper surface housing the crystal. As mentioned, it is a lovely piece of glass. It really suits the vintage aesthetic and it can afford a fairly tall box because it's not a big or bulky watch in any way, shape or form. The unguarded crown is 5.7 millimeters in diameter and also features the King Seiko shield that you just saw on the case back. The bracelet end links are nicely integrated with the lugs. There's a slight step, but overall it looks good. It's a really neat and tidy looking case overall this one and definitely deserved to be brought back in the 2020s. The bracelet also deserves to be brought back. It is the best bracelet I've seen on a Seiko. But that is like saying the pig is the prettiest one on the farm. Seiko aren't exactly renowned for getting bracelets right, are they? But they got this one right. I would describe it as a jubilee. -er. It's kind of seven flat link jubilee style, brushed upper surfaces and sides, but with high polished edges to the five small mid links that reveal themselves on a wrist roll and a high polished chamfer to the edges of the outer links. Because it's a seven link bracelet, there is plenty of flex for comfort but it's not all roses. It's held together using a pin and collar system and not screws, and it features a butterfly clasp, but no half links. I mentioned earlier on, I have this one set up loose. Chances are you will too. Now the dial and hands are not quite a one for one copy of a 60s King Seiko, but they're not a million miles away either. The Seiko logo is applied, but King Seiko and Automatic are just printed on in silver. All indices are also applied. One to 11 are faceted rectangular batons with two high polish edges and a flat upper surface featuring concentric horizontal lines. The index at 12 is double width and has two crossed hatched upper surfaces. This was very much a King Seiko signature from the 1960s. Dauphine hands also featured on many of their models. These just have a simple bevel down the middle and they have employed Seiko's contemporary trick of half half finishing, i.e. half polished, half frosted. I've seen this elsewhere and really liked it and has a huge impact on the low light legibility of this particular watch. Indeed, this particular watch has some of the best low light legibility of any unloomed watch that I have owned. The second hand is a very simple needle with minimal counterbalance. There is some super discreet dial text down around the six o'clock advertising Japan and that 6R31. It is barely legible though, perhaps Seiko realized they shouldn't be crowing about putting a 6R in an $1,800 watch. The color is lovely though, a deep burgundy red in low light that turns bright ruby red in sunlight with a very strong sunburst effect. I don't have any red in my collection, or at least I didn't until three weeks ago, another reason why I grabbed this one. Plus, I like this size of watch. I enjoy the short lug to lug. I like how it looks from arm's length, and I like how it looks in perspective in a full length mirror, for example. I've got plenty of bigger watches than this, but quite often they do look or feel a little too large. You already know whether you'd be happy wearing a 37 mil watch or not. This one is nice and comfortable. It has a really good bracelet with plenty of articulation. The crown is fairly small. It doesn't dig into the back of your hand and 122 grams means you know it's there, but you can wear it loose no problem, which is just as well because you probably will be wearing it loose as discussed. The wrist roll is pretty spectacular because of that seven link bracelet. It plays with the light beautifully, just like the sunburst ruby dial and those faceted mixed finished Dauphine hands. So it may only be 37 mil, but there is plenty going on that it doesn't lack wrist presence.
All right, moans and niggles. Well, I have a couple that apply regardless of how much or how little you paid for one of these. And I'll tell you how much I paid in just a second. The bracelet may be great, arguably the best I've seen on a Seiko, but where are the half links? It's not a big or heavy watch, so I don't mind wearing it loose, but it's certainly looser than I would like it to be. As is that butterfly clasp, there is quite a bit of flex there. And the pushers on that butterfly clasp could definitely be smaller. This isn't the first watch that I've complained about this. The most recent Mayan that I reviewed had the same problem. The pushers are a little bit obtrusive. They just dig into the wrist slightly more than I would have liked them to. Now, I've already said I do like the half-frosted, half-polished look that Seiko do on the hands of some of their dressier pieces but I think it might be just a bit obvious in this case, especially in combination with that strong dial color. It just looks slightly contrived, slightly forced. The corollary of that though is fantastic low light legibility. So I guess it's a bit of a trade off. And overall, the watch is definitely on the dressier end of the spectrum. I'm in full Sydney winter plumage at the moment. So uh, hoodies, track pants and joggers. And I've worn this watch a lot since I got it, but often thought it looked too dressy for my outfit. So do bear that in mind. If you're thinking about this one as a one watch collection, you might actually need another couple of watches, a Prospects or a G-Shock or something to wear on more casual occasions. And then there is the movement, a 6R, 3 hertz movement for 1800 US retail. <sighs> Bloody hell. Don't forget that Seiko used to put the previous 6R into the 300 US dollar Saab range. You're not buying this one for the movement, put it that way. And the one in this particular watch is frankly a bit of a disaster. Now, I know this is not a brand new watch, so I have to be a little bit careful, but I bought this watch from my friend Zane, who is a well-known collector with a huge collection. The watch was unmarked when I picked it up, and he told me he'd worn it maybe half a dozen times. Have a look at that time graph of reading. It's awful. I've had this now for about three weeks and I've noticed that it runs consistently slowly, minus 15 to minus 20 at best when fully wound. But if it sits in the box for two days, it gets slower and slower and slower. I've had it reading minus 200 seconds per day when it's close to the end of its power reserve. Now, I did not pay retail, of course, for this. Zane did me a great deal. I paid 1,350 Aussie dollars, just over half of the retail price, and crucially, just under my 1,000 US dollar self-imposed limit. And Zane did transfer the warranty to me over three and a half years remaining because he bought it from the boutique. So I could, if I wanted, take it in and get it seen to, but that would likely take between three and five months. Or I could take the case back off myself and adjust it, which would likely take between three and five minutes, but that is unlikely to fix the problem entirely. Leave me a comment, let me know what you think I should do with it. As I said, this is not a new watch, so I cannot nail it to the wall. I have to give it the benefit of the doubt. But here we are again, giving Seiko the benefit of the doubt. This time not at $250, but at $1,800. This watch deserves a better movement. Of that, there is no doubt. The King Seiko brand deserves a better movement. Even if this one was running spot on, it would still be well below par for this style of watch with this price tag. So do I think there's enough here to justify the retail price? No way. But then, when have I ever paid retail price or suggested that you pay retail price for a big brand, especially Seiko? At half price though, it's much more tempting, even with the lingering question mark about the 6R. I know that people in the watch community put Grand Seiko on a pedestal, and believe me, I have looked at them in great detail myself. I'm not suggesting this King Seiko is a like for like, but Seiko seems to have slotted this line of watches in between Grand Seiko above and their Presage line below. And if you like the look, you like the size, and you can get one at a good price, there is definitely an argument for picking up one of these instead of either of those. Just try and pick up one that's still in warranty. So there you have it, my vow and my reputation are both intact. Just. There's no way I would have bought one of these at retail, but I simply could not go past one at 50% off and with three and a half years of Seiko warranty remaining. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you want to see some terrible Seiko QC that pushed me into that dummy spit, click here or click here. I hope to see you all again in a future video.